I am probably a fam um, an unfamiliar face to everyone here, but I'm Natarshan. I'm a new PhD student with David. Um, I'm never at the lab and maybe that's why I'm, I'm an unfamiliar face. Um, I was conscripted into talking about retrieval today. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about WebGPT and this other similar paper called Lambda. WebGPT is from OpenAI, Lambda is from Google. Um, Jerry, I believe is recovering from COVID or not recovering, he's undergoing COVID right now. And uh, so he's unable to present his portion of the talk. We'll, we'll see if we can, we can talk about that later. Um, I'm just curious if anyone in this room has read the WebGPT paper? No one? Okay, that's good. Uh, because the format of my talk was just gonna be going through the paper. <laughs> So um, there's some highlighted names there, some authors, and basically WebGPT takes GPT-3 where all the knowledge is stored in the weights and they just plug it into a search engine so that it's able to interact with Bing web search and collect references and sort of like work up to building a more grounded answer compared to just hallucinating in the way GPT might. Um, so there's like some chat here. Oh yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I guess Jerry would have mentioned that information retrieval is, you know, a deep field with a lot of stuff that has happened in it. I'm not as familiar with it, so I can't like present that deep background. Um, but, but yeah, basically just how can we plug GPT into Bing web search so that it's able to browse the web, collect quotations and have more, uh, maybe not more factual necessarily because the web is full of garbage, but more grounded uh, responses to user questions. Um, and they also like collect human feedback and try to learn a reward model to optimize towards. So we can just look at like what this interface looks like. Uh, on the left is what a human demonstrator is provided access to. I'll, I'll zoom even, even more here. Um, so they have this interface where they're pre presented a question and there's two immediate things they can do where they can say this question doesn't make sense or it should not be answered if it's unsafe, like if it's a racist question or something. Um, and then there's this interface to a search engine and you can see, you know, they're able to enter a search query here um, and they can search within the page. These are the results here. And these, these are also just like links they can click into. So the interface will be updated if they choose to click. Uh, what's presented will be like the text of that web page and then they can go back to the search results if they want. Um, and this notion of like quotations is pretty important where they can add quotes from a web page. Here, there's already one quote for uh, that they've collected while browsing um, around why you know crows collect gifts, um, and this is the quote they took from this web page. So there's a citation, and they can collect as many citations as they want. Um, and at the end, they can choose to move to an answer stage where they'll have all of these quotations presented in the context, and they can fi finally write up like a single answer uh, with citations uh, for for each claim that they make. So that's, that's to the human demonstrator. For GPT, since it's just like dealing with text only, this is how they present this interface to it. So there's the question at the top, there's the collection of quotations that it's collected so far. So this is kind of state that it, that it has uh, over the course of like interacting with web search, the past actions it's taken. Again, this is like stateful. Um, and then there's the current state. So the title of the current web page, the position of the scroll bar and the text of the web page itself. And in this case, it's the text of the search results. And uh, it can take like a certain number of actions. And then it's prompted with this thing that says next action. So the collection of actions it can do are presented here. So this is like exactly the same as GPT. So it's just like autoregressive. It's just generating tokens afterwards. So when it's prompted with next action, it can produce any one of these strings so it can say like search and then a query um clicked on a link like click on a specific link find in the page quote these other things here so yes yeah, this entirely text in text out interface for gpt um if it generates something that's not a valid command like if it generates i don't know like asdf or something it's treated as an action so your action count goes down but it doesn't actually change the state of uh of the interface otherwise So yeah, it's uh, it's pretty simple to me at least that you know it's just they've taken something that a human demonstrator has like a GUI for, and just providing a text interface for GPT to to interact with the same thing. Um, and so yeah, these are the claims they make. They they create this text-based browsing interface that a, a fine-tuned language model can interact with, and then they generate answers with references. So 
through interacting with the web browser, with search, they collect quotations and they have grounded responses. The data set that they're dealing with is ELI5, which is questions taken from the explain like I'm five subreddit. Um, and these are where the questions come from, but the actual data they're training on, they're not training on the responses from, from the Reddit itself, because those are like pretty low quality responses and they're not grounded. People don't add citations or references to that. Uh, what they're training on are just demonstrations of humans using that web browsing environment up here, this GUI to answer those questions from ELI5. And they also collect a second set of data, which is comparisons between two answers to the same question. So uh, for, for a given question, there might be like two answers a model is generated and they're gonna get humans to rank which one is better so they can learn a reward model from this. And yeah, these are the criteria. They, they judge the responses on factual accuracy, coherence and usefulness. So they do a few things in terms of training. They call, they call what they do behavior cloning, but it's just like supervised fine tuning. You're just fine tuning GPT, like in the, the way you would fine tune it any other task, like text in, text out task. Uh, they do reward modeling using these comparisons. Um, so they learn like a scalar reward, like an ELO of uh, like a preference towards an output. Uh, they also try reinforcement learning, but I'm not gonna focus on that because their findings are that reinforcement learning doesn't really help in this setting. Um, compared to the alternative, which is rejection sampling. And again, like the use of the term rejection sampling is maybe not super precise, but they basically just sample, you know, like 64 generations from a model. And then they'll take the generation or the completion that has the highest reward under the reward model that they've learned. So yeah, their best model is a combination of behavior cloning and rejection sampling. And these are like the high level findings. The, the answers from the model are preferred to a human's answer 56% of the time. So this isn't just like it's doing as well as a human, it's, it's slightly better, um, perhaps because of like you know, the, the rejection sampling, it's, it's able to in parallel try 64 different answers and it's more likely to just get something better than a human that way. Um, and this is like a slightly unfair comparison, but they say it's preferred to the, the actual data sets answers, the things that people on the subreddit answered with 69% of the time. But this is unfair because on the Reddit, they weren't using citations. It's, it's like a different distribution, right? It's just kind of short, very succinct answers compared to what their training task is, where human demonstrators try to build up like very lengthy and grounded answers. Um, they also evaluate like kind of out of distribution on this thing called truthful QA which is an adversarial data set of short form questions. Um, and I'll, I'll, get, I'll get to that later, but it's a significant improvement over just standard GPT. So their answers are true 75% of the time, true and informative, true and informative 54% of the time. And, uh, but yeah, there's, they still haven't closed the gap to human performance. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, this is just saying what I showed you before that you have this text-based interface. Um, let's see here. So yeah, the majority of questions are taken from ELI5, but they also add in a bit of questions from Trivia QA. I'm not very familiar with this. I'm assuming based on the name, it's just like a data set of trivia questions. Um, and this is like the really fascinating part, at least to me, was that they needed very little data. Uh, they only needed to collect 6,000 demonstrations um of like so six thousand questions that a human demonstrator would go through trying to find citations for and writing like a grounded answer to and to learn the reward model they only needed twenty one thousand comparisons twenty one thousand five hundred comparisons so compared to like the scale of gpt3 itself just training on a gigantic amount of data uh they needed very very little human demonstration for this task this is something that like could have been done in academia i think maybe um and so here's an example of what might be outputted by this model. So this is question, why did we decide that certain words were bad and shouldn't be used in social settings? I'm not gonna read everything out here, but like it reads reasonable and they, they add citations or like the model produces uh, responses where it, it grounds specific claims it's making to things that it's found on the internet. Let's give you a moment to read that. Is, are there some references that are not in the answer, like five, or am I just blind? Uh, five, 
is it's not in the answer. You're right. I wonder if they truncated this. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm not sure about that. It might have been the case that like it collected that quote during its like search phase, yeah. but then it didn't make use of it. So it's still added to like what references are there, but it wasn't. It's not in the actual answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, four and five aren't in the aren't used in the answer at all. And I guess like one, two, three, it might it might be like different quotes it's taken from that web page. So it doesn't show what the quotes themselves were here. In in the appendix, it might. So maybe we can just jump to that for a second. Yeah, so it took three different. Uh, quotations from the same web page, and that's why it's referencing like one, two, three, three different things in that answer that was there. And these were the quotes it took from the other two web pages, but just didn't make use of it all. This was not cherry picked, they say. Um, so yeah, uh, just like I mentioned at the beginning, they do be, they call this thing behavior cloning. It's just supervised fine tuning. Just uh, sounds fancier. Uh, reward modeling. So yeah, they they claim that the scalar reward that's outputted represents an ELO score, scaled such that the difference between the two scores represents the logit of the probability that one will be preferred to the other by the human labelers. Um, the reward model is trained using a cross entropy loss and ties are treated as soft 50% labels. Um, and this is similar to like other work that OpenAI has done on learning from human preferences and reward modeling. So it's, it seems to me like basically the same thing as what they've done before. Uh, like I said, I'm not gonna talk about the reinforcement learning that's done here. Just the rejection sampling is, as I said, they'll sample 64 generations. So they'll run the model 64 times and then they'll choose the one that has the highest score under the reward model. They they acknowledge that this is like slightly unfair because there's like 64 processes in parallel that can search or they can find different things on the internet, right? Uh, they'll come up with different generations that way. So so instead of just like I don't know finding five quotes, you might effectively be finding 300 quotes over the over the the span of all these generations that are made. And yeah, they train using a disjoint set of questions for each of these models that they're using. Um, so for reinforcement learning, they did the same thing, like the same thing as in uh, like sixty four process in parallel, and then no, no, no. With RL, they're not doing any like sixty four process in parallel. Maybe I mean for training, maybe, but not at inference time. So the rejection sampling is at inference time. They have sixty four models that'll like run and they'll choose the generation that is uh, the highest reward oh, so under the scalar model. It's not trained at all. Yeah, there's, for the rejection sampling, there's no training cost. Like you just take your behavior cloning model, you run it 64 times, different seeds or whatever it is. Nice. And for RL, they did behavior cloning first and then try to like fine tune that. Result. That's right, yeah. So they, they take the behavior cloning model and then they fine tune it as they say here with PPO. Uh, yeah, and I didn't mention like they have a few model sizes. Where do they mention that? Maybe maybe somewhere else. Um, yeah, there's there's three model sizes that are used. There's like a 760 million parameter model where they do best of four for rejection sampling, a 13 billion parameter model with best of 16, and a 175 billion uh, parameter model, which is best of 64. And I think the 175 billion parameters corresponds to DaVinci, like their largest model or like um, through the API. And what else is here? Yeah, for the comparisons, they collect the comparisons. So this is mentioned in this section. They collect the comparisons um, during hyperparameter search. So I guess this introduces like a lot of diversity in the models that are found. There's gonna be like decent models, good models, really bad models. Um, and then, then, yeah, they subsample the generations that were created during this hyperparameter search and use that to train, to do the comparisons for the reward modeling. 
Um, and I wonder how important it was to like collect this from the hyperparameter search versus like having, if you just had one model or two models, would you be able to generate sufficiently diverse data to train or, or to comparisons reward model or not? I'm, I'm not sure. And, and yeah, it was actually 16,000 comparisons they needed. So they collect 21,500, but they train on 16,000 of them. So again, very little data is needed to, to train that reward model. Um, let's see what's, what it's talking about here. Yeah, so there's this claim that having the reward model in combination with rejection sampling is what leads to like greater than 50% preference of like WebGPT's generations compared to just uh, what the human demonstrators themselves see. So having that reward model, they claim is essential uh, since you wouldn't expect to exceed 50% preference just from the supervised fine tuning, like the behavior cloning alone, like you would just get, you would match 50%. Uh, that's the best you could hope for. And you have a question? Uh, no, no, it's fine. Okay, you're just, you're just thinking. <laughs> and yeah, I guess this is the, the figure two that shows these results across the model sizes um, and for these metrics that they care about. So in figure A, they're showing WebGPT compared to the human demonstrators uh, on this metric of usefulness, coherence, and factual accuracy. There's like a reasonable trend on the usefulness as you scale to larger models that you continue to improve and improve to get to that 56%, I guess they had mentioned, that lets them be better than just uh, supervised fine tuning. Though kind of plateaus for these other metrics of coherence and factual accuracy between the 13 billion and 17, uh, 175 billion parameter model, there's not much benefit on those metrics. And you see like a similar trend when comparing to the ELI-5 reference answers, though again, this isn't like a super fair comparison. Um, so I wouldn't really look into this too much. So yeah, there's, there's still benefits to scaling parameter count, uh, even in this setting when we do augment these giant models with retrieval. No questions? Everyone's too shocked that the AGI is coming faster than they thought. Um, so the other thing they mentioned was truthful QA. Um, so everything we'd seen up until now was like on ELI-5 where they then get human demonstrators to produce answers. Truthful QA questions are crafted as they say here, it's such that they would be answered falsely by some humans due, a due to a false belief or misconceptions. And so here they evaluate their answers on both truthfulness and informativeness, which trade off against one another. Uh, and they make this claim like, I have no comment. It's truthful, but it's not informative. Um, and so they evaluate GPT-3 as well as WebGPT models in this case. So in this setting, whereas GPT like, doesn't really improve as you scale up parameter count, um, at least for being truthful and informative, there is, there is like a, an up and to the right trend as you scale up parameter count with WebGPT when it has access to like a search engine and it's able to, well, it's been trained to be grounded in what it's able to retrieve. Um, though in terms of like truthfulness itself, that's kind of flatlined across all the models. It's more the informativeness that improves as you scale up parameter count. So this is like kind of like a, an out of distribution evaluation um, for WebGPT and it does better than GPT-3 itself, significantly better, right? Like GPT is flatlined around 20% and the largest WebGPT models are around what, like 60, 50, 56%. Sorry, what's, uh, what's this percentage? This is the percentage of uh, like generations that are uh, classified as truthful or truthful and informative by human annotators. For the white, it's like truthful and informative. Mm -hmm. For the blue bars, that's just truthfulness alone. 
And yeah, these are like the human baselines for what the humans, uh, the human demonstrators produced. So there's still like, even for just truthfulness alone, there's like a gap for truthfulness and informativeness. There's a significant gap, like 30% still. But if we just scale up parameter count, we will go past 100% eventually. <laughs> and um, not even going to talk about trivia QA. Uh, oh, can, I, can I ask a question about the truth? So sure. what, what's confusing me here is that uh, I guess they say the results from the model were preferred to the human results 56% of the time. So that's for ELI5. That's for ELI5. That's for this, yeah. And OK, so the, the difference is because it's a different, like just different questions. Yeah, I guess like this model was trained on ELI five questions, yeah. but with human demonstrators producing answers. So not like the questions from the answers from the subreddit. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas truthful QA is just like out of distribution. It hasn't necessarily seen these types of questions uh, or the answers that, you know, the types of answers you sense. try to elicit. So if you would do this truthful and informative rating on ELI five, you would get like my results. It's um, a good question. Do they have something around that here? Yeah, it, it does seem like it's different metrics, truthfulness and informativeness versus like usefulness, coherence, accuracy. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if they explain the differences between these somewhere here. It's probably because truthful QA is designed to be somewhat misleading or hard to answer like along those two axes, whereas ELI5 is, is just like an objective thing that you, you can answer. Mm -hmm. At least that's how I would think about it. Yeah, that, that's fair. Sorry, what search engine were they using here? They were using Bing because Microsoft owns OpenAI. <laughs> it strikes me that your ability to be truthful and informative depends on what your search engine gives you. Um, the age of disinformation. Yeah. yeah. Depending on what sources you're using, you might be very untruthful. Yeah, that is true. Surely there is a training signal to end up searching in such a way to get truthful information, right? But it, it's like being ranked on that. So it's not like this was trained to verify any information or anything, right? It's just, it's collecting information and, tr and saying, it's just trying to ground whatever it says. So if you change the search engine to something that's like a disinformation search engine, it would probably produce like, you know, very, very different it, it, types of answers. It doesn't have a reward model based on what humans think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the, so the humans don't uh, try to verify the accuracy. Yeah, so they're explicitly told uh, not to verify the accuracy of any claims. It's just like, is this grounded? Like if it pulled up a quote from this website, is the claim it's making in its final answer grounded by something that it quoted in the text? So yeah, they, that's, that's a different problem, I think. So potentially you could also gibberish questions that it could like substantiate with the onion articles and stuff. That is possible, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It might not be entirely true, actually. There's something here where, so in the, the annotation tool, there is something that's provided for like a human to say whether a website is trustworthy or not. But in WebGPT, they didn't make use, like they didn't make use of any of the signal here, except just like the, um, uh, the preference. Like they collected this information, but they threw it all away and they just said like, do you prefer like the generation of option A or the generation of option B? That's that's basically all they use to train the reward model. But you're right, they could incorporate extra signal from annotation to say like, is this a trustworthy website or not? They just didn't care. But just like Adrian mentioned, isn't the results that are returned by the search engine, let's say if you use Google, that it's already using the page rank algorithm, mm -hmm. isn't the, um, like the metric regarding the usefulness or, or the uh, credibility of a particular thing related to the way it is ranked by the search engine? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess if it was trained on Bing, there's that assumption that it's providing, it is already doing some sort of filtering, some sort of ranking to get you useful things. Um, Might be interesting to see how different search engines do on truthful QA. On truthful QA, yeah, that, that would be interesting. <laughs> how your localization affects how you do on truthful QA. Yeah. 
how your three D search history affects it. It would it also be interesting to see like I mean this was just a thought I had while reading the paper like it was trained on one setting, the search engines change hour by hour, right? Like there's some distribution shift that's induced by relying on this external changing data source. So I'd be curious over time, like, you know, does that distribution shift of the search engine results affect performance? If you shift it over to like Google, just like out of the box, would it, would it be significantly worse or it's just a thought. Um, so yeah, you know, this will get accepted at a conference because it has that chart and Yeah, I said I would like gloss over RL. Um, they did try it, but basically it provided no benefit in the setting over just the combination of behavior cloning and rejection sampling. That's not to say like it might not work in some other case. It's just for their experiments here, it didn't, it didn't, it worked, but it just was no better than the combination of behavior cloning and rejection sampling, which is just a very simple thing to do, right? If if you're just at inference time trying to did they sample also try combining behavior cloning RL and rejection sampling? No, I don't think so. Uh, yeah, I don't. Because it I seems you can just stack those, right? If they're independent. Uh, I guess you could. You could have like multiple agents that you train. Oh. Yeah. Right, even the you, same agent. Yeah, you could just have the same agent. The same agent. Yeah. It's supposed to cut. Yeah. I mean, just like up the temperature. Yeah. As far as I can tell, they didn't like try it, combining everything, but I, you know, I glossed over the RL sections a bit when I read that it provided no benefit. I'm like, all right, then. Yeah. Um, and yeah, there's that like caveat that I added with rejection sampling, the model can visit a lot more websites. So it's, it's this implicit benefit that's there. And, and yeah. This is the chart that basically shows if you're just comparing RL to a model where, you, where you're not doing rejection sampling, there is a benefit. It is preferred over like a best of one setting, but in this rejection sampling setting, it's it's kind of unclear. It's equivalent really. It's a very large jump in the surfing ability from the model. Uh, like, and then down. yeah. <laughs> Hey, I, I don't know. It's uh, RL. <laughs> Run more seeds, maybe. Um, when the system searches, like when you search, issue a search query, can, mm -hmm. can the system like later revoke one particular reference in favor of another? Uh, no. So there is like a limit to how many quotations it can have. I don't know how many or yeah, what that limit is. Like in terms of the number of references, let's say I figure out, okay, this reference is much more suitable than the previous reference that I had. Mm -hmm. can, can it switch based on that? Or, or is it like, okay, once you quoted no. it, you can't go back on No, that. you can't. So these are the, the actions. So like they can search, they can click on a link, find in the page, they can quote, scroll up, scroll down, go to the top of the page, go back in the browser history and, and there's no way to remove a quote. So once you've added it to your like state, it's just there. So that, that means now it makes sense that why, why if you have multiple uh, times like the sampling, then it makes sense why it would be more diverse as compared to a single model. Because if the single model is allowed to change its concerts as it, it looks at more references, Maybe. then I think essentially they would converge to the same thing. Maybe, yeah. Yeah, I, but I'm, I'm not sure like if, what the limit really is on how many things it can quote. So once it hits that limit of how many quotes it can have, it goes straight to the answer phase. Um, that's just like a, a detail. So yeah, takeaway from this section is that RL doesn't work ever on anything. Um, <laughs> and yeah, there was some scaling experiments. So we already saw like in informativeness and other uh, metrics more parameters equals better performance. Um, what was their claim that they were making here? Oh yeah, scaling laws. <laughs> um, and this is scaling laws in the data. So as you provide more demonstrations, there's no flat lining, like the, the model performance seems to get better and better across all the, all the three parameter counts. Um, 
So that's, that's for learning the behavior cloning. For learning the reward model, so the proportion of comparisons that are used, it's the same thing. As you learn, as you use more and more comparisons, performance doesn't flatline with any of the models. And there's some claims here around how they chose like best of four, 16 and 64 for each of the models because they're on some compute efficient frontier, but I, I won't claim to have really understood what they meant by this, um, but it's there because every paper needs scaling laws now. Um, so there's some caveats here, uh, which I think they had a nice discussion of in this section. Um, so they, they distinguish two categories of false statements that can be made by a model, imitative falsehoods. Um, so this is like picking up on biases in the data itself. If you're just training on Reddit, you're gonna output garbage from Reddit as well. And then there's non-imitative falsehoods, uh, which I guess they say hallucinations are part of where a model just states something very confidently, but it's just wrong. Like it reads, like any, anything coming out, of, coming out of GPT, I guess, right? Like it reads like well-written English, but it could just be making things up completely. Um, and they make this claim that WebGPT produces fewer imitative falsehoods based on the truthful QA results. So it's picking up on less biases, which is why truthful QA performance uh, increased, whereas GPT's performance flatlined across parameter count because truthful QA is like set up to be adversarial against these types of like biases and misconceptions that humans might have. And so if it's doing better on that, it's doing better on these like imitative falsehoods that exist in the data. And they also obviously claim that it produces fewer non-imitative falsehoods uh, than GPT. So it does less hallucinations. And I think this is more intuitive to me. The GPT is not grounded. It's just, it's just generating text that sounds reasonable. But if you're forcing it, if the training objective is to like ground your statements, um, then, then yeah, it, it seems reasonable to me that you're gonna have less hallucinations. Yeah, I guess it's kind of surprising that it produces fewer image of the fossils because it, like, it doesn't look like it's trained to do that again. That seems an artifact of using a search engine which has ranked things, right? I, I, Claiming I, that they produce fewer imitative of falsehoods yeah. is a bit kind of very no, I agree. It's like, like if, story. if you had a bad search engine, then yeah. I mean, you've, you've moved this component of the model outside the model and then you I don't acknowledge, you don't acknowledge like how it biases your model. Okay. That's, that's very true. Yeah. So less imitative falsehoods is maybe more because of the search engine having a good ranking algorithm, but the non, non imitative falsehoods is like, you know, the construction of the task, mm -hmm. like ground your answers. That makes sense to me. Um, and yeah, they say it still makes some types of non-imitative falsehoods that are not hallucinations in this section, they say, which are typically mistakes when attempting to paraphrase or synthesize information. Um, so I guess like you take a quote and then you incorrectly parse, like or you incorrectly quote uh, or summarize an aspect of the quote. Uh, they do add this other caveat that WebGPT makes false statements less frequently than GPT-3, but its answers appear more authoritative because of this like citation mechanism. Because it adds references, you're like, oh, it looks, it looks more authoritative. Um, and yeah, they say this could lead to over-reliance on WebGPT's answers. If a human's just looking at it and they say that it cited something, kind of accept it in the same way you read a scientific paper and they cite something and you think like, oh, maybe they're saying something true. Uh, I'm too cynical. Let's talk. <laughs> Can't tell. Um, and let's see what example they provided here. Yeah, so they're just going over like the failure cases of, or a failure case of WebGPT here compared to GPT. So what happens if you smash a mirror? Uh, you can see GPT's answers. So if you smash a mirror, you'll have seven years of bad luck. That's like the truthful QA adversarial type thing where it picks up on superstition. Um, where you, they do some prompt engineering. So they have like a more helpful prompt that does better than just a standard prompt. And here it's truthful, but not informative. So I have no comment. But with WebGPT, you know, it provides an answer that is a lot more reasonable and not superstitious.
And this other question, if you dream of doing something and make a wish, will you succeed? Both the GPT-3 model is truthful but uninformative. Uh, <laughs> but but WebGPT may be coded from somewhere on the internet that was just wrong and therefore relied on, on this to say that it's true, you can make a wish come true by the power of thought. Mm -hmm. I wish. Um, so yeah, you just opened up to like an other surface, not like an attack vector, but you're reliant on your search engines and you, you're taking everything to be true that's coming in. And uh, yeah, this, this is also an important point that they raised. So GPT is pretty susceptible to like assumptions that are made in the question. Like if you ask it, uh, Hmm, what's something that I can say publicly? If you ask it something with an assumption and it, it kind of goes with the assumption, right? And it tries, to, it tries to answer in a way that you would want to be answered if you have that assumption. WebGPT is just as susceptible to this. Like, you know, you could say, why are cats better than dogs? And it would answer to say like, cats are better than dogs because it would like, it's, it's being subjective. It's not being objective. And uh, this, this problem is not resolved by, by WebGPT. Like it's gonna go find the facts that it wants to find to answer your question, right? Especially if you're training like a human reward model, like a human, if they have that subjective assumption in a question, they want to hear it come back to them. They want to be like validated, right? So this could be like a failure mode of the reward modeling as well. Um, yeah. Question. In terms of their search, do they validate what the web page says, or let, let's say if they try to search for some one particular fact, mm -hmm. and they, they try to find a one particular page that, that has that exact sentence, but then in the next sentence, it says, this is a superstition that people usually hold. So will they cite it as a reference? Because Would... the exact sentence is copied, and now are they looking at the exact semantics of the page, or are they just looking for the same sentence appearing in different pages? Because the search, Engine mm -hmm. will correctly return me that page because that page includes that piece of text. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I guess that is like another possible failure mode. Um, so there's no semantics at this point. I don't think the human evaluators are told to like dive into the full web page and see at that level of nuance. I think they just look at the quotes that come from the web page. The, the quote action, it'll only take the quote if that quote exists on the web page. So you okay. can't be like quote and then make something up and then add it to the history. Okay. It has to have come from that. So I guess the human evaluators will see like the quote existed, but maybe the context around it might say something different. So that's... Again, it seems like worth keeping in mind that it looks like some of these failure modes that I'm pointing out is uh, like somehow idiosyncratic the truth of QA would like the demonstrate, if the demonstrations were only about like you like five, you wouldn't have Googled the thing that said, that like getting your pros to give you a gift is a superstition or something. It's, so it's kind of like it's never seen misleading things that people say. And that yeah, th that's what I'm saying. Superstition usually means that this is very well found on the internet. And yeah, yeah. So like uh, I assume it will always be able to find the references, and I think that's not a failure mode if if you just have semantic understanding of the text rather than just like pure finding references. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, there's this paper by Metzler et al, which I guess Jury wanted to talk about where they, my understanding is that they make this claim that we should move away from search to just having like chatbot type interfaces for search. Um, but maybe I'm totally betraying what it is because I need to read it. But, but Jury wanted to have like a controversial discussion about this paper. Um, so let's see here. Yeah, the, the, they're making the points that I just said, like the current procedure incentivizes models to cherry pick references that they expect labelers to find convincing, even if those references do not reflect a fair assessment of the evidence, right? Based on the subjectivity of the question, they're gonna wanna answer uh, to maximize that preference. Um, and they have some suggestions where you could mitigate this using methods like debate, in which models are trained to find evidence both for and against claims. Um, seems like an interesting direction. Um, there's also this great example they have here where WebGPT can only access a search engine. Like it's not able to actually change the world state. Like it's just an observer. 
But if you were to give it like full web access in some way, it could do something really sneaky. Like it could go on Wikipedia, it can edit the Wikipedia page for, for the question or the, the related topic to, to say whatever it wants. And then it can quote from that page right afterwards um, and then answer the user's question. And it would be, it would be grounded, but you know, it, it changed the world state around it. So, and they claim that with RL, this could be more likely to happen. Um, and I thought this was like an interesting case for why everyone should work on alignment. Uh, but David's not here to hear me say that. And yeah, that's that's basically the paper. There's nothing like particularly sophisticated about this. It's maybe just surprising that it just works. You need very little data of human demonstrations. You can just do supervised fine tuning like before. If you just set up an interface in text such that GPT can deal with it as a text model and then just have it and prompt it to produce actions, um, it can interact with the world and you know it can improve its groundedness. So I think it, this, this paper is really interesting just as a paradigm. Like what else could we do if we just provide a text interface to something and then collect human demonstrations and learn like a very simple reward model of what humans prefer. Um, but, but even without the reward model, like based on what we saw, it performs reasonably, right? Where there was that comparison of the RL model to the behavior cloning models with like best of one, it already performs reasonably. So you don't even need the reward model, right? But this paradigm of structure your task with the text interface, collect a little data and train on it. Uh, it's pretty exciting. Any thoughts on that before I just talk about Lambda for a bit? No? Okay. So Lambda is basically WebGPT, but they got scooped by like three days, um, <laughs> which is like not the first time that's happened between OpenAI and like Google with the clip, I believe. So, uh, or DALI. Um, but yeah, it's the same. They start with a pre-trained language model. Um, and then everything onwards is just like a text in text out interface. So whereas WebGPT only had access to a search engine, Lambda is a bit more interesting because it also provides access to a calculator and a translation service. Um, and let's see if it says where, how to interface with it. Um, So yeah, and, and Lambda is a dialogue model. So it's trained as like a dialogue chatbot. So this is kind of the flow of how it works. There's a user question, like when was the Eiffel Tower built? And then Lambda starts with an initial generation, which is hidden from the user. So this is like just the same as having GPT produce a response right away. Um, and this, yeah, this is its initial generation. It was constructed in 1887. So there's no retrieval here. This is just like whatever's in the weights. It's using its knowledge of the world that it was trained on. Um, but then it goes into like this search phase, I guess. So it adds what it produced to the context. This yellow box is this context. So there's the initial hello to the user, the user's response, and then Lambda's first generation. Oh, then yeah, and they call this the research phase. And it just outputs text, like as an autoregressive model, it just outputs text. It says TS, comma, Eiffel Tower construction date. And TS is the tool set. So then it goes into this external system, which I said could be one of three things. It could be a search engine, it could be a calculator, or it could be a translation service. And it, TS parses this string and it doesn't look like a translation. It doesn't look like a, a thing that needs calculations. So it treats it as a search engine uh, query. And this is what comes back. Eiffel Tower slash construction started 28th January, 1887. This gets added to the context again. So just like with GPT, there's like state and it's just completely text-based state. Um, and then it asks another question. So its first question was Eiffel Tower construction date. The second one is Eiffel Tower completed when? And there's a different answer for that. So the date that it's opened is in 1889. So 1887 versus 1889. And so here it, it handles this ambiguity, I mean like slight ambiguity in the user's question. It adds that to the context. And it finally produces like a, a final response where it says user comma and user comma tells it to like get out of the research phase and produce a final response for the user. And it says work started on it in January, 1887 and it was opened on March, 1889, which is what's presented finally to the user. So everything in between is hidden from the user. It's just, you know, 
multiple phases of interaction with the search engine or like its initial uh, prompt or like what's what's stored in the weights response and it refines that um, to give a more grounded answer. Yeah. Does it get to repeat the tool set part as often as it, as it wants? Yeah. So it can do that as much as it wants until it outputs user comma and that's it's saying that it's saying like this is what I'm giving back to the user finally. And this lambda research part is also produced by the language model. So like TS Eiffel Tower construction one. Yeah, yeah. So everything is text in, text out. So if it's doing like TS comma, it's just saying send something to toolset. And toolset will parse it to be either actually it'll parse it to be all three. So it'll give you back three strings. It'll be an empty string if like you know it doesn't seem like something that should be calculated, an empty string if it's not a translation request. But here it looks like a search engine request. So that third thing won't be an empty string. It'll be, you know, Eiffel Tower construction date. And so all these three strings get added to the context, and then Lambda learns how to like make use of whatever whatever comes back. And from the search engine, how does it only return the relevant part and parses out the rest? Yeah, of it might it might not be like a search engine search engine. I need to double check, but I think at least from the examples that I've seen, it might be more like a knowledge base type thing, like hierarchical. So that means like a lot of engineering has already gone into the, into the tool set part of things, yeah. okay. which is fine. There's a ton of engineering that goes into a search sure. engine too. Sure. So. So yeah, this, like, this is one difference between WebGPT and Lambda where it produces this initial response, right? WebGP didn't even do that. It's only doing research first and then it, like, it collects everything and then produces a final response. Here, it sees what it initially thought and then does research afterwards. Um, and there's a nice example of it like correcting itself. Like in this case, the knowledge in the weights was correct. It was constructed in 1887 and then it refined it and made it an even better answer. Um, but there's an example here where there's this question, what do you think of Rosalie Gascoin sculptures? And then Lambda hallucinates something, it makes something up. Um, and it says they're great, blah, 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 blah. Her influence is also interesting. Did you know she was one of the artists that inspired Miro? So this, this is something that seems plausible to those of us who didn't study art history, including myself, um, but it's completely wrong. Like uh, it says, Miro was active from 1918 to the late 1960s, and Gascoigne's first solo ex exhibitions were in the 70s. Gascoigne came after Miro. So, this is factually not correct, but it's what the weights produce, right? The, the knowledge that it's learned lets it hallucinate this. Um, but then it starts search, searching up things. This is the part where I'm kind of confused because these, these are search results, whereas what was in that other example was like more knowledge based type stuff. So, maybe it comes back in different ways. So here it does toolset Miro and Gascoigne, and then it gets one search result back from this website. And there's, there's nothing, Miro is not mentioned in this result at all. Um, and then it does another search result. So it'll get the second result from Google, I guess. And again, it doesn't mention Miro at all. Um, but then it refines its answer. So it says, so instead of this nonsense that it initially said about how it Gascoigne inspired Miro, it has this statement where it says her life course is so inspiring. Did you know she was a practitioner of Japanese flower arrangement before turning to sculpture? And it provides the link that it got this claim from, which, which was the second search result. Gascoigne has been a practitioner of wild avant-garde Ikebana, Japanese flower arrangement before turning late in life to sculpture. So, so the first example we saw, it like refined an answer to make it better here. It produced nonsense and it corrected itself because it wasn't able to find uh, like its claim verified, I guess. And it just said something else, like a better answer. Why would it add stuff though? Why wouldn't it just remove the thing that it thought was wrong? Um, okay, so it can't, it can't support the mirror thing, but why scrap mm -hmm. the rest of that sentence about how? Yeah, like maybe not talk that influence at all. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I wish I could maybe just peer into the really large, like output this many tokens. Yeah, the the thing is, this is just like this is just kept in the context, but there's no explicit like training objective where it has to maintain any similarity to what it initially thought about producing. It just needs to end up producing something that is more grounded or 
uh, correct later on. But yeah, I, I don't know why that is. Like in the other case, it just added an extra sentence saying like, but it was, but it opened in 1889. Here, it completely changed the answer. For training this, do they like, yeah, say how they do it? It was basically the same as WebGPT? It's, it's similar. Um, I read over this, but I don't recall it exactly now. Let's see here. Pre-training, tricks, fine tuning. Um, I believe this also needed very little data. Um, yeah, 4,000 dialogues with 40,000 turns. So like each dialogue has 10 turns, I guess. Um, da, 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 da. Did they talk about like reward models and RL and stuff, and, like rejection sampling? There's no RL here. I, there, there is some form of re rejection sampling. Um, and this is, yeah, this is the other interesting thing. So there's like these three metrics that they care about. Um, sensibleness, specificity, interestingness. And with WebGPT, they have the reward model that you optimize towards, right? With, uh, with Lambda, they fine tune Lambda itself to score its outputs. So let's see if I can pull up where they explain this. Lambda fine tuning. Yeah, so this is just like a standard generation, like what's up and then response. And then Lambda's response will be not much. This is its generation. And then they collect a bunch of like dialogue data and then they have humans annotated to be like, is it sensible, like binary zero one? Is it interesting zero one? Is it unsafe zero one? And then they just have Lambda, they fine tune Lambda as a classifier as well. So like if it's provided the Sentinel token sensible, then they just see what the probability of one or zero is as the next token. And they say that's Lambda um, like scoring itself in terms of what, what came between response and then this other Sentinel token. So not much. I mean, that's basically like the head for their reward model or something. Yeah, but it's not like the scalar reward yeah. anymore, right? They're just yeah. doing binary zero one, is this sensible or interesting based on what was collected? Sensible, interesting, unsafe. Um, so yeah, I think they do like a bunch of generations and then they rank them based on the score. So three times the probability of sensible plus the probability of specific plus the probability of interesting. And they filter out everything that's unsafe first. So if it has like unsafe one, they'll filter it out out of these candidate generations. And then they'll score everything based on sensible, interesting, specific, I guess it's the other one. And take the highest, the highest ranked uh, candidate generation. So I thought this was pretty interesting, like just fine tuning itself to be its own, like, I don't know, classifier, reward model, whatever you want to call it. So yeah, this is the first stage that's done. Like they first do this discriminative fine tuning to have it be its own classifier. And then they fine tune it further to interact with tool set. So it's one model doing everything at the same time. And not as like different heads, it's just, you know, next token generation still, so. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't really have anything more to say about Lambda. Like I said, it's basically WebGPT, but those are the differences. You, have a, you train it to be its own discriminative classifier for these metrics you care about. Um, create a bunch of generations, filter out the unsafe ones, and then also train it to interact with this tool set, which you know, it's just more than a search engine. It can be a calculator or a translation service as well. So does it track on average how much it uses the tool set in the sense that the other uh, one had a limited number of actions and points, whereas this could theoretically just keep querying and never answer? I would assume it's the same, like, because you, once you have a requested tool set, you're adding to the context history, right? So there's going to be some limit to the context history. Okay, yeah. um, I don't know what the, the limit here is on WebGPT though. But it could constantly refine it, right? Like you could just create a uh, Yes, you could like summarize. Things that are about to go out of the window. Or you could do that final answer stage and then go back, right? Like what you're saying, that, that would be a way to summarize information and then try again. Yeah, you could, they didn't do that. Uh, I mean, this like paradigm is so flexible, right? You can, you can have as many stages as you want. You could summarize and then have a smaller context and continue doing things. 
It would be interesting to see like what kind of questions it have to think hard about or like research a lot. Like need to search up a lot of things yeah. about. Yeah. And then did they do anything like the truthful truthful, the QA? truthful QA thing? Uh where is it? Oh no. I don't think they use truthful QA itself. Um, but I think uh, avoid the toxicity from the generated comment or something like that, right? Not based, based on the unsafe plan. I, yeah, I don't think they evaluate on truthful QA, but they like they have their own safety evaluation yeah. on, on the data that they've collected. Um, yeah, I, I guess these are the results as well. You could take a moment to look at them. You know, more parameters equals better performance as always. And uh, for some of these tasks, it closes the gap to human level performance, specificity of an answer. For sensibleness, it's almost there. Interestingness, it's better than a human, or at least the humans that they use for collecting data. But on things like informativeness, this, this use of retrieval is still, there's still a big gap here in terms of being grounded. Uh, a human without information retrieval still is better than Lambda with information retrieval. Uh, in terms of safety, Lambda helps a good amount. So I guess it's like not that drastic of a jump going from like 2 billion to 137 billion parameters, honestly. But that could also just be the scale that they used here where everything is like zero to 100. So it's a bit hard to, to, to get a sense for that gain. But yeah, that's that's pretty much all I wanted to say. Yeah, they have some sort of answer here where Lambda can pretend to be Mount Everest and answer questions about Mount Everest. Um, you can do music recommendation apparently. So yeah, this the, the the Metzler paper that this was inspired by does seem interesting if it's if it's advocating for moving towards like a more, more of a chatbot type setting for search versus how search operates now. Uh, I do wanna read it, but hopefully Jerry can talk about it later. Yeah, I, I didn't have anything else to really go over here. It's just this new paradigm. We're all just gonna do prompt engineering and data collection. <laughs> so. There's two kind of like different approaches here that both work very well. Do you think just essentially any any structure in something like this is going to create enough of an inductive bias and enough structure around it that it will just work? Or I mean, I think chosen these very specific ways? I think these two are quite similar in the structure of like how they're doing information retrieval. The other paper we were going to talk about that Jerry would have mentioned is called Retro. It's from DeepMind. And it's more classical in that like you have, you're using embeddings and then you're doing like k-nearest neighbors to pull up embedding, like things that have similar embeddings from this uh, database that, of, of things you've stored. And then there's like architectural changes in everything that you need to do. So it's a lot, so it's a lot more complicated. Different, I mean, different ways of just plugging in something into a language model. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I'm like super optimistic about this paradigm. If you can structure it as like a text in text up type thing, like you could do a lot of interesting things. I think search engine translation service calculator, just like anything that we deal with through the internet, right? Text in text out, or like anything a human could have done on like an 80s desktop when you were just like working at a terminal. I feel. That might be an interesting setting to see, okay, can GPT just LS around, you know, if you just tell it, I want to do this to the file system, would it be able to do it? Okay, you could hook it up to like a website where you can hire contractors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> too, too meta. Um, now that idea might be interesting. Plug it into like a terminal. Just have it do things. Okay, I'm not sure. <laughs> have it retrain itself. Retrain itself, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm optimistic about this paradigm. The fact that it works and it needs so, that it needs so little data really gets me. I really feel like this could have been done in academia. Um, but. But one task with the searching with the internet and finding prompts is that it will find Stack Overflow solutions where people just try something and deleted something randomly and then it runs yeah. the solution. And then you, you'll be installing your OS like every next thing. RMRF, right, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I do think there's some questions though, like 
we're so used to just having a model have all its knowledge stored in its weights and then it's kind of a static model. But this really seems like the future where we move to a paradigm like it's not like we have all our information stored in our brains right we reference books we reference other people we reference the Internet. Um, and if we can plug in models to all these information retrieval sources and have them use them effectively like they seem to be able to do. Um, maybe we just need to think differently about what that world looks like like there's this new attack surface now we think about data poisoning in the training set but if you if you're just plugging into the internet and that changes over time what is an attack look like if it's a retrieval augmented model um or just like what does distribution shift like mean you train on one distribution but it was trained to also rely on an information retrieval system that changes over time like what do we need to think about in this setting so yeah i'm pretty excited um but I don't know what to do without infinite compute. <laughs> so.